Dobre ráno. Ja som veľmi rada, že som tady, ale zapomnel som moju častinu, Česko. OK, forget it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to just tell you, hi, thanks for letting us be here. I wanted to tell you uh, what we're going to do. Uh, Eric Edelstein, uh, a amazing, talented, and successful political consultant in the United States, is going to uh, speak for about 10 minutes. And then I'm going to ask him a series of questions, which I hope will be off of his presentation. And then we'll give you the opportunity to ask him some questions as well. Um, I'll just, on a personal note about Eric, um, my husband and I, as you heard, were uh, very friendly with President Barack Obama, had worked for him for many years, and we were involved in the one congressional campaign, the one election that he ever lost, which was running for Congress in Illinois, and the person who managed his opponent's campaign, who was in charge of his media, is Eric. So Eric helped to destroy the original Barack Obama. Um, all right. Without further ado, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm going to go through this slide deck quickly and jump around on a lot of different topics. Um, we, we all know uh, that we live in an era of fragmentation. Um, it's a lot of what's going to be talked about today. And fragmentation leads to alienation. And in the United States, it's, it's led to um, a certain brand of populism. Uh, to quantify this, in 1958 in the United States, 73% of Americans, three quarters of Americans, trusted their government. In 2016, uh, on the verge of electing Donald Trump, only 17% of Americans said that they trusted their government. Uh, a reference to what Professor Deneen was talking about in terms of the decline of belief in institutions. Lots of reasons for that, and we could spend college seminars talking about it. One of the main ones is the urban-rural divide, the move from a labor to a knowledge-based economy. Um, as the world becomes more complicated, we seek simpler solutions. Uh, and the famous line that um, people often don't know what they want, but they certainly know what they are against, rise of, of reason to not like your government. Um, in Europe, I don't have to tell anyone in this room, we've seen the rise of right-wing populism from 1980 to 2016. It's virtually a straight line up. Many of the same cultural, political, um, and geographic factors have led to that sort of rise. Um, Hungary, Poland, uh, Western Europe, England, it's it's everywhere. Um, I don't, I don't think that we need to spend much time identifying the problem as much as talking about some of the causes. Um, to me, to go forward, it's always helpful to go backwards. I'm no historian, but I believe in learning from the past. And so the question I always ask is, when we live in a moment of crisis, um, has it ever been worse? Well, I think that there's a tendency in my country to often talk about the good old days and a time when politics was much more civil, when people got along and things seemed to get along. And yet, when you go back in history and you can pick any presidential election from our past, it belies that truth. And I think it's important to give some context to that. I picked a random election of 1828. Uh, Andrew Jackson was running against John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, for those who don't know, was the son of John Adams, one of the founding members. Well, if you want to go back to the good old days of a, of a very calm politics, in this election, uh, John Quincy Adams supporters attacked Andrew Jackson and his wife. They called her, and I quote, a dirty black wench and a convicted adulteress. And they said his mother was a common prostitute. The attacks came from the fact that um, Rachel Jackson had been previously married before she married Jackson. And there was some dispute as to whether she'd been legally divorced before she married him. Um, there were also rumors spread by uh, John Quincy Adams that Andrew Jackson had once eaten 12 dead Indians for breakfast or lunch, I'm not sure. Apparently, he preferred eating Indians for breakfast. And um, the, the Adams campaign handed out what they called the coffin handbills that were a list of all the people who Jackson had allegedly killed. Now, the Jackson campaign gave as good as they got. They spread rumors that Adams had sold his wife and other American women to the Tsar of Russia to be concubines. These were the good old days when politics were calm and genteel and everyone got along. And to anyone who doesn't think those had real-world implications, um, 
Jackson won that election and his wife um, was so traumatized by the attacks on her that she literally um, died shortly before Jackson took office. She never became First Lady of the United States and for the rest of his life Jackson blamed the attacks and the personal politics. Um, I, I dwell on this only because I think it gives context to the notion that somehow um, we live in an age where politics are much more rough and tumble in our country than they ever were. I don't believe that. Um, but let's quantify it. There has been polarization, there's no question about it. In 1976, presidential election, what you're looking at is a map by the several thousand counties in the United States. The blue were counties that Jimmy Carter won and the red were counties that Gerald Ford run, won. As you can see, it's fairly dis diffused. It's, there's, there's blue and there's red throughout the country. Now let's fast forward to 2016. Um, Hillary Clinton is in the blue and Donald Trump is in the red. And as you can see, um, the blue is pushed out to the coasts, to the urban areas, and the red is throughout the rest of the country. We could look at presidential elections in the, in the interest of time. I'm not going to look at the maps from 1976 to 2016, but you'll see a phenomenal shift in the red and the blue, and the blue gets pushed out to the coasts and the urban areas, and the red becomes interior. Um, so the question is, has it been worse than that? And I would say, and not that this is the bar we should set, in 1865 in my country, the map looked like this, um, when brothers took up arms against each other and we had a civil war. Um, that led to the deaths of 600,000 Americans. Now, I, 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 it gives little solace to say, yes, yeah, sure, things could be worse. We could be taking up arms and killing each other. But I do think it's helpful in context to say um, the notion of the past being genteel and the politics being more civil is just not the truth from history. Um, now, the fact is there are some data points that suggest some positivity. Uh, I don't want to be a Pollyanna, and I don't want to suggest that everything is great and wonderful and we're going to talk about it being not. But the fact is, you know better than I, 70 years of relative peace in Europe, um, no civil war in the United States. Something has worked. Something has held the center together. Um, but the fact remains, what, what is at the core of this? We heard a lot from the professor about political theory. I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about human behavior for a moment. I, I work in the realm of um, electronic communications, and electronic communications tend to be emotional, um, not so rational. There was a book several years ago, I don't know if some of you may have read, it was an Israeli author, Yuval Harari, called Sapiens, which was, why did Homo sapiens become the dominant species? There were other human forms um, at the dawn of time, but you, sapiens took over the planet. And his argument is fundamentally based on two factors. One, he said that sapiens had the ability to organize large groups um, in a way that other species did not, and that um, fundamentally sapiens were uh, were endowed with imagination and could create um, constructs like property, um, boundaries, governments, things that didn't really exist in nature, but they were able to create. And he divides the world up into this preliterate time when emotion versus reason were in conflict, um, and that really sapiens emerged because they were able to both conquer emotion, use some reason, but also understand that fear um, was something that was incredibly motivating. Then we entered the literate age. Uh, the printing press was created. The Bible was printed. We enter the age of the Enlightenment and the, and the Renaissance um, and the notion that reason will set us free. And Harari would suggest that um, this was an important time, um, but it sort of masked the notion that emotion somehow um, could be overcome by reason. Um, the fact of the matter is today we live in a, what I would call a post-literate world where our, our dominant forms of communication, television and the internet, um, determine so much of what we see and these mediums are not about reason, they are about emotion. Marshall McLuhan, a famous, um, I guess, media philosopher you describe, who well, you, you probably know him by his famous quote that the medium is the message, he also said that we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. And what he meant by that is we create television, we create the internet, and then we become created by them. And as we see today, we live in the sovereignty of the moment where spectacle uh, takes over and emotion and feeling in sort of a non-narrative way control our politics. Um, 
and who controls those tools. Um, I know there's going to be other speakers much more informed on this later today, but I just wanted to touch on a couple facts. Between Facebook, Google, and Amazon, um, they control so much of what we see. 70% of web traffic around the world um, are, are controlled by Google and Facebook. Amazon controls 50% of the e-tail that's, that's bought in this world today. And someone said, whoever controls your eyeballs runs the world. And I would argue, um, perhaps in this age of spectacle, we have three media conglomerates that control what our eyeballs see for the most part. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, we are capable, um, despite of all the problems we have, of these magical moments. 1776, this enlightened group of men came together and said that people should be self-governed. Um, you saw it in 1989 in the Velvet Revolution, um, where people came together and said, we can peaceably create self-government, and we can divide ourselves in a way that is advantageous to everyone. But I would argue, and this is the challenge of our times, that democracy and self-government are not natural. Um, tribalism, as Harari said, is natural. Fear and um, emotion dominating us. And so that's how we end up in these politics of populism, how fear is able to motivate us, how it's able to divide in a complicated time. And so the battle is to find these magical moments. It's not that um, that's the natural order. I believe it's not the natural order, which is why it's so unique in human history when these things happen. And that the battle is to find those moments and be able to bring them back and figure out how we shape our own tools and make them happen. Um, there are signs of hope. Um, again, I won't be a Pollyanna, but I'd suggest in my country in 2018, in the midterm elections, turnout was the highest we'd had since 1912. Sometimes it's crisis and catastrophe that brings people together and makes them participate. But we had um, a 49% rate. Now, that doesn't sound great. It's not terrific. But relatively speaking, it's the highest we've had since 1912. And you know, the old notion that young people don't vote, well, the fact is young people between 18 to 29 um, went from 20% vote in 2014 to 36%, which is the largest jump of any age group. Again, a bit of a canary in a coal mine, but a, a slight sign of hope in my mind. Um, and then finally, I, I would just go back to these magical moments, and um, uh, you all know better than I do, uh, the notion that democracy and self-government can be something that we strive for and work for, but it's not something that is natural to human nature, and your first president um, knew that a lot better than I did. Again, I just wanted to touch on a couple of those things, and now we're going to answer some questions from tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, when, by the way, when we originally envisioned this talk, we thought we were going to be sitting by a fireplace, kind of answering questions, and maybe we need to take a Karl Janacek sort of vote where we should be sitting or standing right now, but we'll, I guess we'll just be here. Um, okay, so. I think the question maybe on everybody's mind in here is the first speaker suggested that liberalism is dead and you've given us some reason for hope. So what is it? Are we a doomsday or are we, is it, are things reparable? Um, to, to, to say of colloquialism from Sam Rayburn was a Texas Speaker of the House in the United States. Um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and he had an expression that uh, any jackass can kick down a barn, but it takes a carpenter to build one. And um, I think it's very easy to say it's all failed and it hasn't worked, and we're at this crisis point, and we are. But I think the notion that history is preordained is, is, um, goes against the historical accomplishments that have happened in this country, that have happened in my country, and have happened across the world. So to the question of, is it doomed? Can democracy be salvaged? That's not a question for all of us. That's up to us. Um, it's not a preordained notion that it will succeed or fail. I think for a lot of my career, I spent believing that um, the future was always progress, that self-government and democracy were the natural way of things. And I think as, as I've learned and tried to grow um, both as a practitioner and as a human being, I've come to realize that when you talk about things like the future has to be earned, um, it's not an entitlement. Democracy is not something that's guaranteed. We're seeing 
the, the, the actual polls on that. And in, in my country, our, our daughters are the same generation. And in many ways, um, these trends where they've gone from a Barack Obama, um, where the notion that these, these children grew up in a world that was pluralistic and seemingly democratic and open and progressive to one that um, is really the polar opposite of that, I think in some ways is unbelievably healthy because it says to that generation, there's no guarantee that the world is gonna be the world of the Barack Obamas. It may be the world of the Donald Trumps. And I say that not in a partisan way, but in the way they look at pluralism, the way they look at diversity, um, the way they look at the world at large. So my answer to the question is, I, I agree with everything that's said in terms of this being a crisis moment, but I think it's an opportunity as well. And future generations will say, did they answer the question as to whether democracy was doomed or did they try to do something about it? And I think it's incumbent on all of us, as this symposium is doing today, is to say, let's salvage it and let's find it and let's repeat as many magical moments as we can find. Again, it's not to be a Pollyanna, but it goes back to Harari's book, which is the natural state is we want to be tribal. That's easy. We can fall back into tribes and be fearful and go our separate ways. And in many ways, the technology today um, um, enhances those silos that we're all in and those tribes that we retreat to. And so the, the challenge for humanity, I believe, and for democracy is to get ourselves out of those silos, to find our common humanity, and to find those magical moments again. So to, to follow up on that, even if our intent is good, you work as a practitioner, I'm just wondering if there are structural problems that prevent our intent. And you know, this, about a month ago, Cornell University came out with this interesting paper which was saying that in many ways, um, political partisanship is um, accidental. And that there's really, there's no reason, for example, that your view on taxes should match your view, the views of the same people on religion or on sexual politics, but you wind up in a party and some leaders of your party make these decisions and then suddenly you fall in line with your party, even though you may not have actually felt that way on other issues. And so I'm just wondering what your feeling is about parties in the first place. Are they actually, is, are parties responsible for polarization? Would we be better off if everybody were an independent and could make their own decisions about individual issues? Um, in, in Chicago, we have what's called a jungle primary, uh, in which Eric, maybe you can describe better, uh, where just the top two vote getters go off into runoff. It has nothing to do with parties. So maybe talk to us about some of the structural issues. Um. It's a great question. Very smart people have very different views. There's a, a book by a couple of Harvard professors called Why Democracies Die. And their argument was that the, the, the decline of parties um, actually exacerbates um, uh, the decline of democracies and that they become, parties are shorthand filters that sort of weed out the more extreme elements. Um, that's their argument. Um, in the United States, you know, I, 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 it's, it's fascinating. There's a correlation between the way parties have evolved, because it always hasn't been Democrat, Republican in the United States. Um, they've taken on different, um, different forms, and they've, there's been a correlation between as, as forms of media change, the parties have changed in the United States. And let me tell you what I mean. At the beginning of the founding, we were in um, the partisan newspaper age, where newspapers weren't objective, but they were prevalent. And um, people, the elites in particular had access to them. And that led in the federalist age to the federalist versus the non-federalist, which is really why we initially had the two-party system. And it was federalists versus non-federalists or Republicans. And then we entered the age of what they called the penny newspaper, where um, everybody could buy a newspaper because you had the Industrial Revolution, and um, part, newspapers no longer needed to appeal to partisans, they wanted to appeal to the general public. And the parties evolved at that point, where you ended up um, with, with um, a, a much more of a Democrat, Republican notion, and then you entered 
the age of the telegraph, electronic communications came on the scene. Um, and then you had this, um, the Whigs and the Democrats evolved. And I would argue, it's a long way around your answer, that we haven't seen the party evolution yet in the digital age yet, that, that we're sort of behind the evolution. And the reason I say that is there was also a Pew study of young people in the United States um, about the parties. And this is a generation, you know, in, in any Western country, these children are growing up with unlimited choices, right? They can, whatever movie they want to watch at any time, whatever social group they want to join, wherever they want to shop, um, education from any institution around the world, frankly, is available to them. And these young people say, and in the United States, I have two parties who I have no respect or connection to. Those are my only choices. That's how we govern. I can choose any movie I want to watch on Saturday night, yet um, to govern this country, I have to choose between these two, you know, this binary choice. And I think that's going to evolve very much so. So, um, you know, there are, there are, there are structural, um, impediments in our country to a multi-party system, no question about it, the way the laws are written, the way the systems are set up. But I don't think there's anything preordained about Democrat and Republican. I don't believe doing away with parties and just having an independent slate is necessarily the solution, because I do think parties do provide a shortcut um, to certain values and certain ideas. But I think we are long overdue for an evolution in what we typically now say are Democrat and Republican, because um, these kids today, they're not going to accept that as their only choices, I believe. By the way, I have no idea what Eric's going to answer. This is all new to me, so I'm processing it too. You know, do I. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I used to, having lived here, of course, and I lived in other countries that are parliamentary democracies where there's more than two parties. Um, you know, I was watching it carefully. So, you know, we think of parties as Democrat and Republican, but most countries think of multiple ones. And um, I remember in one country I was living in, there was a taxi driver party that was just the party for the taxi drivers. And I thought that was kind of cool. And of course, most people thought it was crazy. So I, maybe there's some balance in between so we don't have a Netflix-like party structure. Um, OK, so another topic on this structural thing that I'd like you to talk about is uh, something that's very big in the United States right now which is voter suppression. So um, obviously that's antithetical to, to democracy. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about your experience. Uh, Eric represented a very well-known candidate in the last election who was a victim of voter suppression and was robbed of her victory. So I thought maybe you could sure. describe what's going on and how you feel about it. Um. Well, when, when uh, historians and political scientists talk about the genius of the American experiment, they, they often um, talk about three factors. One, that um, for the first time, uh, maybe in human history, a, a, a self-governing society was organized without religion being, being the main piece of it. Um, then they talked about being a Republican form of government. But the third point, was that there was no central authority. Um, despite what people believe that the federal government's in charge, really the Constitution um, doesn't say that the federal government is more important than state government. Um, so what that's led to, unfortunately, in our country is that there's no centralized voting system. The voting systems are controlled at the state level, and really they're controlled at the local level. And so um, to exacerbate racial differences, to mm, promote um, political opportunism, state and county and local laws have been used um, discriminately throughout our country. And that continues today. People think that, well, post-Civil War, um, that somehow everyone's able to vote. I did this race that Tamar referenced for a woman named Stacey Abrams, who was an African-American woman running for governor of Georgia. The United States has never elected uh, an African-American woman governor of any state, let alone in the Deep South. And she got more votes um, than any Democrat in the history of Georgia. And um, she lost, lost by 50,000 votes. Um, what had happened is the, her opponent was the Secretary of State who happened to be in charge of the election. Um, he didn't seem to think it was a conflict that he was running for governor and running the election that he was, um, he was appearing in as well. And what they did is they do very subtle things. Um, they um, decide that in a rural area, where a lot of people are poor and black and don't have cars, 
they're going to close a lot of polling places. So yes, of course you can come vote, but you have to take a day off of work and take four buses and stand in line for five hours. Discourage people from doing that. They did another very fascinating thing where they said, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act says that um, anybody who is disabled in a wheelchair or unable to walk upstairs must have access to a polling place. So they conveniently go into African American precincts and say that this school built in 1930, uh, the polling places are up on the third floor. We have to shut this down. This is not going to be accessible to the ADA. Um, so we're going to close that polling place. And then over the course of 10 years, they purged a million people off of, off, of the, off of the polls for various reasons, saying they hadn't voted in a certain period of time, there wasn't a period over their name where there should have been. The point being, um, even in American democracy, it's unbelievably flawed, and the flaws in the suppression are really a function of there isn't a uniform system of voting, that it's dependent on um, each state. And uh, most famously, in 2000, um, the George Bush Al Gore election, we saw the results of that with uh, flying chads and butterfly ballots and no uniform system, even county by county in Florida that led to um, an unbelievably complicated result. Okay, that's not enough to get you mad. Um, so I, I want to just ask something from your practitioner point of view and then we can come back to some high level issues, which is, in terms of democracy and better democracy and in running campaigns, what in your experience has been the most effective? And I think related to what you said in your talk, uh, tell me, talk to us about negative ads. Do they work? Are they bad for democracy? Um, are they good because they bring out things about people that we should know? Just, you know. Sure. Um, well, before the, before the dawn of the internet, um, when television was the dominant medium of political communications in our country, and it's still the dominant, although receding a bit. Um, I would argue that negative advertising um, all depends on your definitions. I would have many candidates, many clients who would say to me, um, let me just tell you at the beginning of this campaign, we are never going to run a negative ad. We are not going to do that. And then as the campaign would go along, you would say, well, there's this editorial in the Washington Post or the Los Angeles Times that says your opponent is a dirty, rotten person who did this and that. Can we use that in an advertisement? Oh, sure, that's not negative. That's someone else saying something about them. So I always find the definitions of what is a negative ad um, are in, in, in incredibly insightful. Um, negative ads per se don't work. What I think works is authenticity. Um, and that works at every level. You know, the candidates wouldn't need people like me or any sort of practitioner of um, communications if they could go talk to every voter, meet every voter, make their pitch to every voter. But obviously in large democracies, that's not possible, so there has to be a shorthand. But what happens is um, we all become, particularly in television, we become experts um, at, the, at the medium when we know what we see isn't truthful or is false. And so when candidates are saying things that aren't particularly authentic to who they are, um, I don't believe the idea that you can just take a poll and put it in someone's mouth and have them repeat it on television and it works. Now I say this, I'm talking about television. I think we're different when we talk about digital and I think you're gonna hear some, some more talks later on about um, fake news and um, the manipulation of propaganda and all that and obviously we've seen examples of the internet um, uh, being a purveyor of that. I think that as time goes on and we become more sophisticated consumers of internet um, communications and politics, we will know more what is authentic and what is not. And so I think the general question of does negative advertising work, I would say every election is a choice and it's always fair to lay out your choices for voters. The question becomes tone and um, reliability and authenticity. And yes, it is easier to win elections, as Abraham Lincoln said, um, through fear than by appealing to the better angels of our nature. Um, but I also think fear only gets you so far. And um, more often than not, you're able to bring that back um, and do comparative advertising that doesn't have to be about the politics of destruction. Yeah. 
Uh, your answer is actually reminding me of something that does give me a little bit of hope, which is there is a movement now on at university campuses in the United States, an organization called Better Angels, which is students coming together bipartisan in a bipartisan way on campuses to talk about uh, hot political issues and figuring out a way to build civil discourse. And this is like kind of a grassroots thing. It's a better, better Angels organization that I think might give us some hope for trying to resolve this partisan divide. So thank you for reminding me about that. Um, so the, I'm, I know H21 from its you know, technology and civic combination. And so I want to just, and I, as a computer scientist, I feel the need to ask at least one technology question of you, which is um, obviously, as you know, and as you work, digital media is a game changer in, tor in terms of getting messages out. And I'm wondering, should we view media companies as technology companies that are a platform for public discourse or a media company, or are they media companies providing news and opinions? Like, what is it now? Maybe that's not an interesting question, but help us sort that out. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I also get often get asked the derivative of that question: is is technology good or bad for politics? And the answer is yes, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's yes. Um, unbelievably democratizing in many, many ways. Access to education for people who didn't have access. Access to information for people who didn't have it. But also the the chance of manipulation. I'll go back to the slide I had earlier where Amazon, Google, um, and Facebook control so much of what we see. So the notion of the internet truly being this free space of um, interaction and dialogue when you have algorithms that Google acknowledges um, exacerbate polarization. They say that if you go on an extremist website um, or watch on YouTube an extremist video, the algorithm brings up other extremist videos for you to watch. That's the way some mathematician designed that algorithm. They could have designed it to say, we're going to give you the opposite view, or we're going to give you a countervailing perspective so that you have both of that. But it was designed the other way, which reinforces those silos. So I, I think we're, we're in this tricky moment where we have this unbelievable tool. Um, we've seen it be manipulated for harm and wrong. I think ultimately, um, it's going to be a good, but I don't think these companies can can um, operate on their own. I, you know, one slight disagreement I, I would have with Professor Deneen in, in, you know, John Adams, Abraham Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, and Franklin Roosevelt, two Democrats, two Republicans, they believed in a strong federal government um, because of um, what Harari says, that emotion... Um, rules that hierarchies will naturally evolve and you need a strong federal government to fight against corporations like that that control all our eyeballs. You need a strong federal government to create equality and not give in to the tyranny of the majority. So I think what we've seen in our country is a bit of too much of a tilt to the individual freedom that I think the internet has exacerbated and I think we have to get back to that balance between social compact and individual freedom. And the only way to do that is to, to, to figure out how we're going to make those companies that control what we see in our eyeballs do it in a much more objective, pluralistic, um, maybe less commercialized form. How that works, there's smarter people than I to figure that out, but something needs to be done. Well, on, on that, I, I was introduced to an organization about a year ago that for that very point, what they're doing is they're buying up AdWords that are, you know, hate speech AdWords, things you might be looking for if you were in a bad place and wanting to find out more. They're buying them and they don't, and you click on them if you were looking for some racist or hateful thing and they have, they direct you to a site that's not, oh, you know, love your neighbor, but it's a subtle way of getting you to rethink what you're thinking, so they, they know what you're looking for, and they don't scare you off by being the opposite, but then they begin, they give you links to click to that um, help. So it's like people are using technology to counter technology. So I, I, I love that organization. Um, is there a way you think that, that, just to follow up on what you're saying, that these media companies could be less echo chambers? Is there a way that they could see what they're serving up and change it around? Yes, I mean, I, I think there's no question um, 
they, they could, and they're acknowledging it. And I think that's why you're seeing action in Europe and in the United States where they're starting to take some legal action against these companies. And I think, um, you know, they, they started out with this notion that they're going to make the world better, and now they're being blamed for a lot of the world's problems. So um, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how that evolves. What the outcome is, I don't know, but it's very much, to me it's very much like the dawn of the television age where you had three networks that controlled everything that we saw um, and it took some, some time for that to sort of filter out into a way that um, it became, uh, people became more sophisticated about what they were seeing um, and uh, government became a little more sophisticated about how to regulate it. In your own business, what percentage of political marketing is now digital versus traditional, you know, sure. third, fourth state? Um, it, it's still probably about two-thirds would still be television, broadcast television in our country, and about a third would be online. I think that's, those numbers are changing. In the commercial advertising world in our country, it's more 50-50, um, but that's, you know, a, a different industry where it's point of purchase and um, people are actually making a transaction, whereas an election is a, basically a one-day sale. Um, so I think it will continue to evolve. I think in the 2020 election, it'll probably be somewhere around 60-40. I mean, television still remains the dominant way to reach the most people the quickest, um, and that hasn't changed. Um, but obviously, digital is coming up fast. Maybe there's still time. <laughs> still time to say. Um, okay, so... Um, now in terms of, I want to switch from technology to just general root causes. Um, and I was thinking as you were talking about more engagement and of course in light of Democracy Forum, do you think more engagement would reduce polarization or would it just continue, we would all still go into our buckets? I think we have to engage. I think that's the only hope. I mean, I think that's where those magical moments are created when we we figure out ways to engage with each other and recognize our common humanity. Whether we agree on everything or not, we do agree on certain basic principles, regardless of what our political views, our cultures are, or whatnot. There are certain human traits, and I think um, if we go into our silos, then we can treat our opponents as the other and not human. And I think that's where we end up in the most extremes and the most dangers to, to society and culture, let alone to democracy. So we have to find ways to engage again. And again, I think the internet, it's too easy to, to you know, be the jackass and kick the barn down and say that's the cause of all our problems. Let's make it the tool that helps us fix it. And it is unbelievably democratizing and can allow us to engage with others. But I think we, you know, I, I um, uh, to me, it, it sounds maybe um, simplistic, but I think we have to find ways to get out of our own comfort zones and have conversations with people who we don't agree with all the time. And that becomes increasingly challenging when we live in these urban-rural divides. And people, you know, people in our country, this is one of the most disturbing trends. They say, I don't know anyone who voted for the other, Wh whichever, way, whichever way you want to go, because people live only with the people who vote the way they do. And you, I saw, showed it on that map in 1976. Your neighbors, half of them might have voted for Jimmy Carter and half of them might have voted for Gerald Ford. Today, nobody lives on a block like that in the United States, nobody. And so um, that's a huge geographic problem, but maybe technology can help us overcome that somehow. Okay, so we're time for questions from the audience. Um, the lady in the corner, please. Thank you for a very fascinating lecture. Thank you for your remark about getting out of the comfort zone. This is what I've been trying to do uh, on a grassroots level with the mixed results. Uh, I was wondering uh, whether you would uh, care to comment uh, on an article that uh, was published in the New York Times this May about uh, Nevada being the 15th state that uh, is to vote about the abolition, possible abolition of the electoral college. We are talking here about digital age and technology and uh, this uh, instrument, the electoral college seems to be coming from dark ages, sorry to say so. What are your predictions? What do you think about its future? Um, there is a lot of talk of that. I do know the article you're referring to 
Um, you know, for those that don't know, in 2016, um, Hillary Clinton had three million more popular votes than Donald Trump, yet he won the, the uh, Electoral College. Um, I, it, I'm, I'm a little, uh, no, it doesn't work that well. It's a problem. But um, I think it's also a problem because of the geographic consolidation that I'm talking about if we end up with pure popular vote because then you do have basically an entire country controlled by urban areas. And I don't think that that was the spirit of what the founders wanted. They, the grand compromise was giving those smaller states, those places with less population, um, some power. Now, I would say we've gone too far the other way. You could argue that the United States Senate, um, which is comprised of two members from every state, regardless of population, has given the smaller states overwhelming power because of the filibuster and some of the other arcane rules in the Senate that allow a small minority to control our politics. I don't believe we're headed for a change in Electoral College anytime soon. I think we will have much more conversation about it. Um, I also think that 2020 may be very determinative in that conversation, and here's what I mean. There are some predictions that the Democratic nominee for president could get more than five million votes more than Donald Trump would get. And there's scenarios, certain very plausible scenarios, where Trump could still win an electoral majority. I think if that were the scenario and we start to see these numbers, um, you, you might have more of a call for it. Um, the problem is always when you criticize a system, what replaces it? And um, that's always the, the fear when you open Pandora's box. So it's a great question. Um, it's a great challenge. Um, I do worry, and I don't want to sound anti-democratic, but simply doing um, plebiscites, just will of the majority, isn't the only way to, to create a robust democracy. And I think that's what our founders were trying to grapple with. I just want to. I, I sort of agree with Eric, but I want to just say one thing, and you're just for, in terms of data for everybody. At the time of the founding of the Constitution, the advantage that a rural voter or a small, uh, you know, a big state or small population voter would have had over a regular urban voter was about five to one, which was sort of intentional, okay? The slaves counted as, you know, whatever. Um, but now it's about 60 to one. That's an enormous difference. And so while I agree that I'm not sure a popular vote would help entirely because then you would have lots of people not represented and we don't want, we don't want just New York and California voting for our president, but uh, this is very out of balance. And so I don't know who has the appetite to fix that, but. Okay, we have space for one more question. Oh. Hello. Uh, my name is Wojciech Pikal, I'm from the Pirate Party, and uh, I would like uh, to have a few more remarks. You talked about magical moments and that uh, we are emotional beings, and I completely agree with that, but there needs to be an understanding that these magical moments don't happen at once. There's long and deliberative process be before them, and if... Uh, we and I believe that uh, people are naturally uh, social beings. And we talked about individualism before, and uh, as much as the pursuit of happiness is an pa important part of that, the pursuit uh, many times happens within people's relations. So uh, you also talked about tr tribalism, and this is, I think, what happens now that we have the atomistic society that. Uh, disregarded the old structures like church and family and so on that was taught and now we are living in the endless sea of internet which provides us with the atomization because every one of us can uh, create their own identity based on what they like and what they want to see and uh, the endless sea is now controlled by these corporations that are not here to facilitate discussion or facilitate new structures but they are here to you know, sell you a perfume and uh, sell your information to someone who wants to sell you a yogurt. And this is not a place to create a discussion. So I think we need to create new tools for deliberation on this endless sea of internet because that's how the internet started. It started as message boards for, not for selling you a product, but to facilitate the discussion. And in that time, I think it worked. So I think we need either from the top level or from the 
uh, bottoms of the hacker community uh, to create new tools for deliberation, new social media that won't be oriented for profit. So that's my remarks. And I, I think that's a wonderful way to end this segment because uh, that in many ways is a, a better way of saying what I tried to say, which is, you know, we've always been able to invent better tools to help ourselves. The fact of the matter is nothing's preordained. The, when we were pre-literate and standing around the flickering fires and even then passing on tribal notions, we overcame that. And when in our country it was first, you know, very partisan newspapers that said things like, you know, someone sold their wife to the czar of Russia. We overcame that. And I think we can overcome these challenges too. Um, will we? I don't know. I'm hopeful. Um, but it's up to all of us to do that. And thanks for that comment and thanks for everybody's time. Well, and thank you again to Ma and Eric.